Hello, everyone. There we go. Welcome online. And uh, I want to thank everyone who is part of the team here this morning. I'm hearing an echo, 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 echo. Um, the uh, For those of you who are trying to watch right at 10 o'clock, we had a little bit of a hiccup with the broadcast because Vimeo decided to not let its studio work. Or, I don't know. Gremlins got in the machine. So uh, it's such a good thing that Pastor Sean is here and upstairs because he was able to patch through another system to get the Vimeo to get out to everybody. And so for you guys, it seems seamless. For Pastor Sean, he was pulling hair out, but he doesn't have hair. So um, it got working. And now I can't hear myself. Am I still broadcasting? Anyway, we'll worry about that later. There we go. We got the sound. I... I titled this message, How to Trust When No One Knows What to Do. And honestly, um, I didn't think that no one thought they didn't know what to do. I, I realize everyone has an opinion. I realize everyone will say, this is what we should be doing. This is what we shouldn't be doing. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the fact that we are having mixed messages sent to us since day one. And the latest just makes, is a, it's a head scratcher, right? So a couple of weeks ago, Alberta had to lock down to stop the spike, right? What happened? We had a bigger spike and then things dropped. This week, Texas and Florida opened things up and guess what happened? Numbers went down. Now, what do you do with that? You can't just look at the headlines. You got to read the deeper story. And in Texas and in Florida, they one, they had more people get the virus earlier on. We were already locked down up here, so we kept each other safe, meaning we've just prolonged the inevitable agony that we have to go through. But the second thing was they've had they've had like I think one had 48 and one had 46 percent of everyone vaccinated. So they say that the virus has no place to go basically, with everyone who has been sick and with the virus, they can open up and numbers are dropping because that's what we can look forward to here. But it's tough. It's tough when we have the uh, vaccine companies coming out to say, you're going to have to have an annual booster shot because who wouldn't want that cash cow if you were that company? And then the CDC coming out except, and saying that except for cases, uh, booster shots for the variants, there is no evidence we'll need a booster shot for this. What do we do? I, I, what, I, what do we, where, who do we trust? You know, you hear people, people are adamant. We should have been locked down sooner, locked down tighter. Didn't it work in China? Didn't it work in New Zealand? And it's kind of like, well, if you're in a landlocked country that believes in freedom, it didn't quite work the same way. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Who do we trust? It was millennia ago that David told us who to trust. In Psalm 20, verse 7, he says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Chariots are needed and necessary in battle. They give you the advantage of speed and intimidation. They are incredibly important at that time of year. And that, that's that, the, the Bronze Age and above. Incredibly important. You don't want to go into battle without chariots. Chariots to me are like scientists. You know, we need them. They are necessary. They, we, we, they're the ones leading the fight in this. Horses are the strong, the intimidation. If you've ever seen up close to a horse when it wasn't being nice, you know it's terrifying. Those things are necessary in battle. They, you want them on your side. What if those are like our politicians? You know, like you don't want to step in what horses leave behind, kind of like a politician. And yet they are needed and they're necessary. 
So we could say that some trust in scientists and some in politicians. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. The problem is that most, some of us are trusting in chariots and horses, even though we say we're trusting in God. Does it really matter? Well, let me just run down some of the benefits of trusting in God. These are just amazing. I'm going to highlight them quickly. Let me know if you want these references. I will get them to you somehow, probably on the website. Uh, happiness is a benefit of trusting in God. Proverbs 16, 20. Prosperity is a benefit of trusting in God. Proverbs 28, 25. Safety is a, pro a benefit of trusting in God. So, Proverbs 29, 25. Faithful love is a, is a benefit. Psalm 32, 10. Deliverance is a benefit. Psalm 22, 4 and 5. Health is a benefit. Psalm 27, 8, 28, 7. Joy is a benefit. Psalm 511. Refuge is a benefit. Psalm 26, 8. Salvation is a benefit. Isaiah 12, 2. Peace is a benefit. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Not having fear is a benefit. Psalm 127, 112, 7. We need to trust in the name of the Lord our God. There's a story in the Old Testament that shows us how what that looks like. And it's just one of those stories that we could unpack a thousand different ways. And I'm just going to breeze over it today. The story is when King Jehoshaphat is uh, confronted with three armies. This is 2 Chronicles 20. And um, there's three armies that are coming against him. And he, Jehoshaphat, Here's the news, and he, right away he calls a fast to seek the Lord. And during that fast, he prays a prayer that you and I need to pray at least part of that prayer probably every single day. I'm going to read that prayer, and then we're going to get to the rest of the story. Second Chronicles 20, verses 6 to 12. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nation. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Oh God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And give it to ev forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. They have lived here and have built you a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir whose territories you would not allow Israel to invade when they came to, up from Egypt. So they turned away and did not destroy them. See how they are paying us back to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? Oh God, will you not judge them? Here's the part. For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. How many of us have prayed that prayer or prayed a prayer like that? That is, we don't know what to do, God, but our eyes are upon you. That's what trusting God looks like in this kind of situation. What did he do? He, he focused on who God is. He remind, we, 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 blah, blah, blah. we remind ourselves of what he has done. We remind ourselves of the promise towards us. We acknowledge the reality and the severity of our situation. And we cry out, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Listen to what happens in this story. A prophetic word comes out from the crowd, and that word says, you are to take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord. So what does Jehoshaphat do? They set out the next day, and he puts the praisers at the start of the procession. He puts the ones singing before the army. And they are singing as they go, praising God. If you don't see the connection for your situation... I'm not even going to draw it out. The praisers go first. 
The praisers go first. Look at what happens in Je verses 22 and 23. As they began to sing in praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah. And they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir and destroyed and annihilated them. After that, they finished slaughtering the men from Seir. They destroyed one another. And it took three days for the Israelites to pick up all of the, all of the plunder. It took three days for the people of Judah to pick up everything that was left behind. You and I need to know we're trusting in the one who is trustable. Because these are the kinds of results that happen when we trust in him. When we don't trust in chariots and don't trust in horses, but do trust in the name of the Lord our God. What if you had no fear of bad news when it comes? What if you had the peace and joy that only comes from trusting him? What if you knew you weren't trusting in chariots and horses, but trusting in the name of the Lord your God? What would happen? Let me tell you about my wife's week this week, because she's an excellent example of what happened. Uh, she got an email saying her position at the university was going to be disbanded. Dis, what do they call it? Disrupted. Disrupted. They don't say downsizing anymore. Disrupted. And uh, the university was getting rid of her job. And then she got another email saying, You're, you have to, there's a meeting, you, a mandatory meeting you must attend with HR and, and your supervisor that afternoon. And basically, you just assume they're going to cut you off from everything so you don't screw up them because they're really messing you up, right? Karen didn't panic. She wasn't getting concerned. I'm really proud of the way that she handled it, right? She, she wasn't afraid that she wasn't going to get work. She wasn't afraid about the health plan that she has there, which is really the reason that she works there to take care of me and my health, you know, like it's crazy. Um, you know, she's wondering what God wants her, if God wants her to apply for the, the new positions they're going to make up, or does he want her to go somewhere else? And she's wondering what God has in store for her. Uh, basically, the university, if she gets a new position, it's going to be more work. And by the way, they're negotiating 25% decrease in salaries. So she's going to be doing more work for less money. And that's a great atmosphere to work in, right? The support of people. And yet, what happened may show it's a great atmosphere for her to work in. Because almost every one of the professors she works with called her up or emailed her and said, oh, I'm so, I feel so bad for what's happening to you. Please don't leave if you don't have to leave. But if you have to leave, I'll be a reference. You know, like they, they want to open up the next door for her. Or a couple of them offer jobs. She laughed at one of them, but anyway, that, she said she was just kind of giddy, or like, you know, she laughs when she gets nervous. But anyway, um, I'm really proud of the way she's navigating that. You know, she, I asked her how she would advise people. What, what would you tell people to do if they were faced with this situation? And this is good advice, she says. Her advice is to ask yourself, has this happened before? And if it has, how did God help you through it? And that helps you remember that he's going to help you through it again. Listen, it's the power of testimony. If you've got a story and God's helped you in the past, remind yourself of that. It's the prayer of Jehoshaphat. Remind yourself of that. If you don't have that story, get other people's stories. How does God help them? Because your story helps me. My story needs to help your, you. If there's something that just stirs in you when you hear someone's story about how God has helped them, how God has redeemed them, how they can trust God and know they can trust God, you grab a hold of that. And, and you say, you give that to God. Say, God, you help them. You're going to help me. Read the Psalms. That's exactly what happened in the Psalms. Time and time again. It's how you've helped me or how you've helped that person. 
We need to be trusting in the one who is trustable. Imagine what it would be like. You're going to have those moments, but just imagine what it would be like to have that, this time, to have peace at all times and in every situation. There will be moments, but you can go back to your center. You can go back to that peace that's yours, that joy that is yours. It could be in your health. It could be in your relationships. It could be in your finances. And you're going to get that news that gets you to cry out, Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. How do you know that you're trusting God and just not lip syncing? How do you know? Well, there's a tool. There's a tool that I've developed, and it's called the How Do I Know I'm Trusting God tool. I know they're long, but this one's cool because <laughs> it's based on Proverbs 3, 5 to 12, and I was able to force the word worship in there, and it is so cool because worship is what I'm going to tell you to do, okay? Um, Proverbs 3, 5 to 12, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't depend on your own understanding. Seek your will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything you produce. Then you will, your, he will fill your barns with grain. Your vats will overflow with good wine. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. So the acronym for this tool is worship. And the W, of course, is it starts with wholehearted, wholeheartedly trusting the one who is trustable. You know, I've been harping on this for years. What does it mean to, have, to do something with your whole heart? You do it with a decision, you do it with an action, and you do it with your emotions, or your emotions at least follow. The decision, you make that decision today. You're going to trust God regardless of whatever news comes your way. You're going to trust in the one who is trustable. The action, it's, it's really what God wants you to show. There, there's going to be an action that needs to take place. If I trust God, it could be I start praising him because that's the action that starts activating something. I, I'm going to choose to praise because that's what's important. It could be you, you, if it's finances, God may put it on your heart to give and bless somebody else. But I, I got this much. Well, guess what? The church in Thessalonica was poor and they outgave everyone else. And God blessed them because of that. There is something that happens. I'm not saying that's the go-to, but I'm saying if God tells you to do it, do it. There is some, some kind of action that the Holy Spirit will lead you to that you need to, to take out that step of faith and trust God in. And third is the emotions. Well, the, the emotions that we have when we trust God, I've really been harping on peace, but it's also joy. Peace and joy. What does it say in Romans 15, 13? It says, I pray that the God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with all joy and peace because you trust in him. And then you'll overflow with confident hope by the power of Holy Spirit. That is what trust gives in us. Those are the emotions. The, and they're awesome. The question you can ask yourself if you, if, to know if you're trusting God is, do I feel peace and joy? Where did my peace go? Where did my joy go? Okay, I'm not trusting him. God, show me how do I trust you? How do I do that? I want to choose to trust you. What action do you want me to show? I want to find that peace and that joy. That's the, the W. The O in worship, we have to orientate to his thoughts. Proverbs 3, 5, the second part, don't depend on your own understanding. How do we get his thoughts? The best way is through his word. But it's just not the written word. It's, it's the, the, the very word. It's the word he speaks to your heart, right? Pay attention to the way he speaks to you. It can be through other people. It can be through music. It can be through his word. It, it's going to line up with the word, but pay attention to how he's speaking. 
Um, here, I just put together, I think, nine thoughts about God's thoughts. God's thoughts are deep, Psalm 92.5. God's thoughts are higher, Isaiah 55.9. God's thoughts are precious for me, Psalm 139.17. God's thoughts are too numerous for me to count, Psalm 40, verse 5. God's thoughts are for me are good and merciful, Psalm 144.3. God's thoughts for me speak life, John 10.10. 10. God's thoughts are for all generations, Psalm 33.11. God's thoughts are personal for me, Matthew 10, 29 and 30. God's thoughts are to prosper me and give me hope, Jeremiah 29.10. The question you can ask yourself to know that if you're trusting God, is, am I wanting to hear his thoughts? Am I taking the time to hear his thoughts? Am I in, in the word so that I can hear his thoughts? Am I wanting, crying out, God, tell me, tell me what you think of this situation? We need to be wholeheartedly trusting the one who is trustable. We need to orientate our thoughts to him and the R. We need to respect Holy Spirit's leading. Proverbs 3 6 says, seek his will in all you do, and he'll show you the path to take. We're his sheep. We hear his voice. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We need to seek his will in everything. Ask him, what are your thoughts towards this, God? And then respect Holy Spirit's leading. What is he prompting you to do? What is he wanting you to do? What is he showing you to do? Galatians 5, 16 says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't deceive yourself. You won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. The question we can ask ourselves to know that if we're trusting him, is, is am I asking him for what he wants me to do? When I go to prayer, is it the list of my wants and my desires, or is it spending time with him to say, God, what do you want me to do? One question, I didn't even write this down. One question that has helped me is, Lord, who do you want me to serve today? And sometimes it makes it easy to do. And sometimes it's really uncomfortable to do. But when Holy Spirit gives you the answer to that question, who do you want me to serve today? Obey, do it, do it, and do it in love. The S in worship, I want you to steer clear of wisdom that's not from above. We got this, right? Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And you'll have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Knowledge in our society is too often rewarded, while wisdom is less often revered. 1 Corinthians tells us that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge makes us feel important, but you need to, <laughs> what we need is wisdom that's from above. Remember what that wisdom looks like. James 3.17 Memorize it. Get it in. Wisdom that's from above is, first of all, pure. It's peace-loving. It's gentle at all times and is willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. Look for that wisdom. Live out that wisdom. Show that wisdom to others when, they, when they're asking for it. The H in worship is to honor God with, honor God with your, your life. Proverbs 3, 9 to 10 says, Honor the Lord your, with your wealth and the best part of everything that you produce. Then he'll fill your barns with greens and your vats will overflow with good wine. Jesus told us not to worry, but to seek him in everything. In Matthew 6, he tells us, and if God cares so wonderfully for the water wildflowers that they're here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he'll certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? These things are dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he'll give you everything you need. 
The question you can ask yourself to know if you're trusting God is, does my life show I honor God? Does the way I'm living show others I honor God? Listen, it's not about keeping a list of rules of things you don't do. It is about showing that you have peace at all times and in every situation. It is about seeing that you are there to serve and you are there to love. It is about showing God to the rest of the world. You're the only Jesus some people will ever see. Live well, live well. The I. Let's recap here. The W is wholeheartedly trust the one who is trustable. O is orientate to his thoughts. R is respect Holy Spirit's leading. S is steer clear from wisdom that's not from above. H is honor God with your life. And I is it to insist on treating hardship as discipline. What do I mean by that? Proverbs 3.11 says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. Don't be upset when he corrects you. I've made two decisions in my life that have helped me through every difficult thing since I've made those decisions. Decision number one is I will never give God credit for the works of the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I won't give him credit for the work of Satan. And number two, I've decided to endure hardship as a discipline, hardship as discipline. What does that mean? It means it doesn't matter what I'm going through. God is going to work it out for my good. I'm not going to blame God for what I'm going through, but I'm going to know that he's going to see me through it and he's going to make it right for him. He's going to make me look more like Jesus through what I'm going through. And guess what? He's going to do it anyway. And it just makes sense to let him do it because otherwise you're fighting against him and that never goes well. Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can trust him in that. You can trust him in that. He is going to work it out for the good of those who have been called according to his purpose. That is you. Hebrews 12. Where the heck am I? Oh, I skipped some. Oh, no. I'm reading from the NIV. Hebrews 12. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by the Father. The question you can ask yourself to know if you're trusting God is, am I enduring hardship as discipline? Or do I allow myself to whine and complain a little bit too much? You can for a while. I'm not saying don't. I, I'm saying get back to peace, get back to joy, because that is what we get when we trust Him. The P, oh, this is a good one. The P is we need to place value in God's love. What did Proverbs say? 3.12, for the Lord corrects those he loves as a father corrects his children, his child, in whom he delights. God is for you and not against you. He rejoices over you with singing. He, he delights in you more than the thought. He has, he has thoughts for you more than all the sand on every beach, on every ocean, and every dune, in every desert. Listen, this is, we, we need to remind ourselves of what it says in Romans chapter 8. Paul writes, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does this mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or are destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As scripture says, for your sake, we, have, we are killed every day. We are slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither 
neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen. When you go through trouble, when you go through difficulty, when you go through COVID, can you rest in God's love? Question is, am I resting in God's love? Any of these questions, if you've answered no to honestly, please know God gives us the tools we need to make it right. The tools are confession and repentance. It's simply a matter of just agreeing with God. That's confession. That God, I'm not trusting you. Simplest thing. If I don't have peace or joy, I know I'm not trusting God. So, okay, God, I am not trusting you. That's confession. Repentance is turning around and going the other way. God, how can I trust you? Show me what you want me to do. I'm going to make the decision to trust, and I will do what you show me to do to show myself that I trust. Because I need that peace and that joy in my life. He will enable you. He gives you the power to accomplish every good work prompted by faith. He give, has given you everything you need for life and godliness. He will enable you to trust him with your whole heart. Remember the tool. It's worship. It's like how Jehoshaphat set his, ahead of his armies, he sent the ones who were going to praise. Are you going to set your praise before the battle? Like, that's the question. Will you worship wholeheartedly trust the one who is heart uh, trustable orientate to his thoughts respect holy spirit's leading steer clear from the wisdom that's not from above honor god with your life insist on treating hardship as discipline and place value in god's love listen you are loved live loved worship him as lord of your life in your heart set apart christ as lord the world is in great darkness and he's telling you to arise and shine and let your light. It's his light that you're shining forth. Can I pray? Heavenly Father, I know all of us will get that news that we either have longer to go or we get hit with news that just catches us to our knees. And what I'm praying for now, Lord God, is a desire for peace and joy to rise up in us. And Lord, a recognition that that is just not simply we need peace and joy, but it's a recognition that we need to trust in the one who is trustable. Lord, be with our politicians, be with the scientists, be with the ones that, Lord, they need you. They need you, they need you, they need you. Be with the ones who are willing to say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. And Lord, guide our steps forward to know the, what we're to do. Lord, we need you. We need you to be the light to our feet and the lamp unto our path. We need you, God, to show us what we're to do. I thank you, God. I thank you. Thank you, thank you that you will. In your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching online. We're going to have a quick summary of what's going up and announcements back with Janine.